Hi, my name is Andrew McLaren, and I want to help you with acid bases on the AP chemistry test. I've got some predictions about the 2023 test. Um, essentially, I don't think many of the acid base problems are going to require an actual calculation like an ice chart, and that you should be able to do them conceptually, or at least if there is math, you can estimate and get a good enough estimate to do it without actually doing a calculation. So I'm going to show you a couple examples from the 2022 free response question that kind of highlights this focus that they're having. I really like that they're dropping this math requirement because as a tutor, I've noticed that most students can't do the longer acid-base problems and they just take way too long. So just thinking about the time requirement to do those problems it's very unlikely that the chemistry board is going to put many of those if they don't have shortcuts on them. So they'll probably be giving the ones that you can do shorter just to kind of cover it reasonably. Um, we're also going to look at some example problems that are likely to be on the test and not likely to be on it, just so you can kind of see this and then some other examples beyond this one test. So I have one of the AP Chem tests here, which you can get from the College Board. I'll have a link in the description on how you can get those uh, practice tests, as well as uh, scoring guides from their website. They have them on there for free. And I went through this, and I just did a little glance over it, um, just trying to look for acid-base relevant problems. And you can see a couple here. And there were some other things with like K equilibrium, so you do need to know how to do ice charts for those. But those problems will typically be a little bit easier than like the nasty stuff that you have to do with Ka and Kb. Um, and you're definitely not going to have to do anything with like polyprotic acids um, with like calculations. But there will be conceptual problems that you need to do um, polyprotic acids. And I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. There aren't anything in this set that's particular to that. But you can see this first question is very manageable super, super manageable. So they give you a graph, um, and then they ask you from that graph to tell them what the pKa is. So if you know that an ideal buffer is when we have this plateau, and if you know like your pH is equal to your pKa when the log of um, A minus over HA, when that whole part, that value is zero, that's when A minus is equal to HA, or like half of HA has turned into A minus. So this is at the half equivalence point. So if you conceptually have that general level of understanding, you can just look at this problem and say like, oh, the pKa is at this half equivalence point. You can see the equivalence point is around 10. So the half equivalence point is around 5. Um, and it looks like the pKa is, is 3. It's not very difficult. It's just understanding the general concept of this graph and the shape of this graph. And that will cover you for most of these problems. Like, I'm not even kidding. If you know that, you should be OK for the test. Um, also, if you know the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, you can look at this and say, like, oh, what if the pH is 4? It's like considering that basically these things are not balanced at a 1 to 1 ratio. Now, if you're like me, you might have a hard time with the math here. But I can conceptually think about this as like if I'm in a very acid rich environment, this is mostly HA, like down below um, the buffer line. But if you're above it, it's uh, mostly the A minus. So you can think of like an H rich environment, just putting a ton of H pluses on A minus. So that you've got mostly HA. So if you're in a really hydrogen rich environment, you're going to be mostly HA. If you're in kind of a hydrogen poor environment, you're going to be mostly the A minus. So what they're basically saying is what's going on when you've got this pH of 4 right here. Conceptually, you can see that it's going to be mostly A minus. Um, so it's mostly this guy. And you can think about that as well with the, the Ka is equal to the concentration of H times the um, concentration of a minus over HA. I know I've kind of like separated this from how it's normally written, but you can keep you can kind of think about like, well, if this is a um, like too small of a number for the Ka, like if this is smaller than Ka, um, then this thing's going to be a pretty big, like it's bigger than one. So A minus is bigger than HA in terms of 
of its concentration. So you can kind of justify it that way, saying like, oh, you don't have many H pluses. And so um, you're going to need a lot of A minuses to maintain that equilibrium. And that's one way of approaching that. In addition, we've got a couple other problems, like these two other parts, and then that's it for the acid bases. And these ones are super easy. They give you the Ka, and if you just do the negative log of that number, that gives you the pKa. Um, and I I will think about this in terms of like some some easy examples that I've done where if it was like you had a um, or sorry, this is not the concentration of H, this is for the Ka. Like I know if I have a Ka of 10 up to negative two, that's going to give me like a pKa of two, kind of like if you have a concentration of H of 10 up to negative two, the H is two, right? So you do the same sort of thing here, you just do a negative log of that number which is not too bad, especially seeing how we've got our um, calculators now on the AP exam. So if you do a negative log of, uh, what is it, 6.3 times 10 up to the, the fifth power, or negative fifth power, if you log that and you get a negative of that, then this problem, um, it looks like our pKa is not, uh, what was it? Yeah, it was 4.2, not a negative 4.2 because it's the negative log. It's like 4.2006, it looks like, so just basically 4.2. So not too bad, right? You can definitely do that without having too deep of an understanding. That's even just a formula. Um, and then this last one, they've basically given you really nice numbers here where it's like, oh, you have the same amount of this stuff. So if you use a strong base with it, they should have like the same equivalence point at this like 10, um, the 10 milliliters being that equivalence point. But we now have a different uh, pKa for this chemical. So if we look at this, I believe that was the thing that we just actually calculated. It's like a 4.2. So its plateau is somewhere around here, it looks like and then it kind of curves up likewise, and it should have like some very similar curve to the other one um, after the equivalence point, but before it, it's buffering at the, um, the pKa of that 4.2. So you can see how these two buffer slightly differently, and you're just kind of guesstimating um, on here, and then they're actually telling you that the initial pH is 3.17, so it looks like it should be kind of like coming in like that, so like a slight adjustment that I need to make there. Um, not a big one, but a slight adjustment there. And they don't give us a final pH, but should just keep on kind of approaching that, that 14 in theory. Um, yeah, I think that that's the main thing of the questions that were on the last AP test. As you can see, very manageable. I did all of that in like just over seven minutes. Um, and that was that was it for the free response questions and none of them required an ice chart or anything like that. These are much more manageable than like most of the problems that your uh, AP Chem teachers are giving you. It's just that in college chem, you're likely to see these problems. So it's good that you're getting that practice, but don't freak out for the AP Chem test. You're much more likely to see these guys on there. You might have a couple on the multiple choice, but they should have some tricks you can do. I'll show you in the next bit. Just so you can see the scoring guidelines, these are the points and how they were given. It looks to me like we should be getting credit for those other ones that we that we made here. And this one I'd done like a little bit on the top, which was kind of like lining up, but I think it was close enough. Um, you can see that they've got there, and then this is crossing that uh, PKA at the equivalence point. So it looks like we have got answers that should work for that section. Guess credit. Hey, we just got all the credit for the acid-based questions on the free response section. That's like half the test, so yay. So this is a typical problem set that you would get from a college AP chemistry class, but for AP chem, you oftentimes are told you have to solve these problems, but you're, they just take so long to do that it's not going to be on the AP test. Unless it's something about the equivalence point or half equivalence point, those are super easy. Like I was going through this problem with one of my uh, students that I tutor, 
And I just said, let's look at D and just do that right now. Because that's, that's the half equivalence point. That's that buffer that I was talking about where the pH is equal to the pKa. So like those questions are very likely to be on the test. And then also this like part B where you have an equivalence point where it's just like the two things are being mixed. Um, different concentrations, different volumes, but they're canceling out the amount of um, acid that you're using with the base that it's titrating with, which are not the conjugates. That's very important and kind of confusing for students. But most of the time, this is like some strong acid that's pulling it, a weak base forward. So that weak base now is balanced with its conjugate um, weak acid. I have a whole video on like the difference between strong acids and weak bases. It's a, kind of a longer video, but I'll, I'll try and link that so you guys can see that. Um, so those are kind of likely, um, but when you're trying to calculate the exact pH of along the line and you're just like at any point along the line, that's like not the half equivalence point. Um, good luck. It's those problems take a long time. And if you go past the equivalence point, it's a very similar sort of issue. And you can kind of see that in the problem C here um, that I had to do essentially a C, A, C, B, but like those aren't the same numbers. So there's some left over. So they don't like just go all the way forward, which is the case with our equivalence point. It's just pushing everything forward. We still have some stuff left over as H, A here. So it's not like at that equivalence point. And then we need to look at that balance. Um, and you can do that either with moles or molarity. But like, as you can see, this is getting really difficult to keep track of and do. Like these problems, they are doable. They are just really, really tricky to actually solve them out consistently and get the correct uh, number. So I think that I was able to get the PKA, but it was brutal. And then like, Oh man, there's um, part, uh, when you're asked to find the pH at the equivalence point, that can be kind of, kind of an issue as well. I think that was part E on here. Um, I mean, you can see these problems, they just, they go on and on and on and on and on. Um, that one you had to kind of push all the way forward. Just give me a second, I'm having a hard time navigating. All right, yeah, we have part E here, and basically you push all of the stuff forward so that it's now all of the conjugate base. Um, so I just took the number that I had earlier and pushed it all the way forward. So now the base is, that is what it is. And some of it's going to leak back a little bit to the um, conjugate acid. And so there is a little bit of problem that you can do there, but you'd need to use the KB to do that with the um, appropriate ice chart. And you can totally do it and you can get the POH and then from that, you can get the pH. I would not expect that to be on the AP test. Like that type of problem where you get the pH at the equivalence point is kind of nasty. It's doable, but um, it, there's some tricks to it. Um, and it's very similar actually to the setup of if you just have like a weak acid, just go from the initial point. Those aren't too bad because it's kind of like your familiar setup for your K equilibrium where it's just like got the X squared and your initial concentration. So that one's manageable, but still a little bit more math than I, what I expect they'll have on the test. Let me show you what is much more likely. So I've been getting some problems from my tutoring students. Some of them are a little bit blurry, so I apologize for this one being hard to read. But basically this is a problem describing where there's a yellow indicator that turns blue when it's its conjugate uh, base. So it's an acid. And then there's some oil on top and some solutions. One is at a pH of three, one's at a pH of seven. Um, but we have a pKa uh, value of five. So you're either kind of in an environment where it's too acidic or not acidic enough for this um, buffer point. And so you can think like, hey, like pH of three, that's, that's below. And now it's going to be uh, mostly what? It's going to be mostly the HA because that's in the... A hydrogen rich environment like I was talking about earlier in the video um, and then this is like in a hydrogen poor environment so it's going to have a lot of the a minus to make up for the lack of h to maintain that k equilibrium and so you might think that oh well now we're seeing like a lot of the a minus a lot of ha so you get those different colors in the solution the question was actually asking why does the oil um turn yellow 
And that's the oil's only yellow when we've got the pH of three. It's not yellow when we've got the pH of seven because we have a lot of HA present and HA is nonpolar. It's not like a charged particle. A minus is charged. It's not going to dissolve in a nonpolar oil. So the blue just doesn't even dissolve into the oil at all. This question is a really nice question where they're talking about the general idea of pH and pKa and the relative number of HA and A minus. And it also ties in intermolecular forces. So it covers multiple categories at once. Um, I haven't seen anything like this on the AP exam, but I think this is well within the grasp of what they could put on there. I've seen them do things like this where they combine things before. So it's definitely doable, but you're more likely to see things where it's kind of like just looking at your, your pH and your pKa's. So there's this other question here where they've got two chemicals. They've given you the K equilibrium. It's kind of hard to see, but this is 8.3 times 10 to the negative 4. So it's about a pKa of 3. And this is 2.3 times 10 to the negative 11. And so you've got these two different chemicals, and they're asking you to try and make a buffer solution of approximately a pH of 3. So just immediately thinking about that, you can conceptually think like, oh, well, it's basically this, this red one, that acid-base pair of its conjugates. And it looks like we've got about half of it, the two conjugates there. It's, maybe it's not perfectly half, maybe it's close, but we should be getting a nice mix of the two. And if you look at the options that they've given us here, B, we have HA, and it looks like you can just kind of guesstimate and see like, oh, this is half the volume, same concentration with the that uh, strong base that they have there present. And you can see like, oh, like half of my HA is going to get pulled forward by the, the OH, and we're going to get be left with our 50-50 split between the two. So that works out pretty nice for B. But then like the reason D does not work is that it would buffer just at the wrong pH, like it'd be at like a 10.64, I think is what we'd said it would be. So like D has a nice balance between a, the HA and the A minus, or like the, the two things. I guess you could say the BH plus and the B. It's a nice 50-50 split between those two. You're not using a strong acid to pull one forward. You just have the two conjugates present in comparable amounts. So D also works as a buffer. It's just buffering at the wrong pH. So this is a really nice question. It gets at that general idea of pKa, a buffer solution, and it might look like there's some math in here, but you're really just comparing the amounts of acid and base to each other, which really should be done with moles over the total volume, or you could just think about it as the moles of acid and moles of base. Um, you can kind of compare them like that as well, but technically it is a concentration in the K equilibrium, so you gotta be careful there. I really like this question too, because this is getting at like the only thing that you're going to really need to know for polyprotic acids is this idea of pKa's and the fact that you can have like a pKa1, pKa2, and that those are basically like what we did on the last thing, the area where it's like a 50-50 split between the acid or base that's involved there. So you can kind of see in this problem like the first Ka for H3PO3 is um, 7 times 10 to the negative 3. So that's a, the strongest acidic constant there, which kind of makes sense. It's the first thing donating the proton. And then it's a negative charge, so that's not going to be very good at donating a proton for the second or third ones. So you can kind of think about in that regard, and then like, oh, if I'm in a very acidic rich environment, it's going to be mostly h 3 um, a, and then if you go above the first pKa, now you're no longer at like a 50-50 split between H3a and H2a, but it's mostly H2a until you get to around the pKa2, and that's a nice 50-50 split between H2a- minus and HA2-. minus. So it looked to me like if we want to get a pKa of around 7.9, which was, was, I believe, what we calculated there, and they had asked for um, a buffer around 6.5. It's pretty close. It's not perfect, but we could get that by mixing these two, and they're going to be close to a 50-50 ratio, but if we're actually at 6.5, we'll have a little bit more of H2A than H2-. Um, 
like we'll have a little bit more of, of this guy than that guy. But it's going to be pretty close to a 50-50 split. Um, and then there's, ignore that. That's, that's something that you could potentially do with PK, B, and POH, but that will probably throw people off doing that. I just recommend working with Henderson Hasselbach if you can um, convert to that, then I'd prefer to convert to that. So this is pretty likely to be on the test. If you look at the college board, they have an assessment boundary for polyprotic, and they very, very clearly line this out, that they're not going to make you do ice charts with Ka2 and 3, um, but you do need to conceptually understand what things are going to be mostly common around their, K, their Ka's. <laughs> kind of weird. Thank you for McLearning with me. Before you go, please check out the following services that I offer with my business. So if you click the link in my videos, this goes to my website. I might be changing it from Podia because I'm no longer doing the interactive videos for sale. I might put those up for free, um, but most of my other services are linked here. So you can see that I've got like a Teachers Pay Teachers and a Wiseant. Um, the Teachers Pay Teachers has a lot of my assessments that I have for like the NGSS, as well as lessons that I made when I was actually a teacher in the classroom. So I've got quite a few things like CERs and other things on there. Um, if you want to get one-on-one -on -one live support from me, either like with science or like working on um, like teaching support lessons and that kind of stuff, uh, you can sign up through Wiseant. I have a link to there where you can contact me there. Um, and we can schedule hourly appointments. Um, and I've got a few other things on here, like a Facebook page um, and our social media. And if you're interested in getting professional development with me for like a team of teachers, a whole page with information on that. So yeah, feel free to check that out. Um, thank you.